Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we will give you a minute to get your technology all fixed the way you like it. And then I will um, share my screen with some slides and turn it over to Laura Harmon to get our informational meeting started tonight. So let me share my screen uh, and Laura, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Alan. Um, small group tonight, we'll just go ahead and get started and try to get some things off my screen. Um, uh, make sure that you know the staff that uh, are on here. I'm Laura Harmon, the UDO project manager with um, Alan Goodwin, the deputy project manager and uh, project planners, Kevin May and Sandy Montgomery. So um, we want to talk tonight about the Campus Zoning District's Text Amendment 2023-174 that has been filed and give you guys a little bit of information on that. And go to the next slide. So we will um, present information on the text amendment. You have the Zoom chat feature to enter questions or comments. And of course we have a small group. So if we need, need to come off mute as we get to stopping points and, and ask questions or make comments, um, we invite you to do that as well. Next slide. Um, so we are really focused only on the contents of the campus text amendment. Um, and again, we'll receive and consider feedback from the session attendees. And we had a noon session uh, on this topic as well. And then any questions on other elements of the UDO can be submitted uh, to Charlotte UDO at charlottenc.gov and address, we'll address those as well or get them to the folks who can best address any other questions or comments you might have. Um, I think the by the folks that we have on this call, they're pretty familiar with this, but just in case someone, um, this is their first foray into um, learning about the UDO, uh, the Unified Development Ordinance, it's our primary regulatory implementation tool for the adopted policies um, in the Charlotte Future 2040 Comprehensive Plan. And the UDO itself was adopted by city council on August um, 22nd of 2022 and um, went into effect last June 1st. Um, and so it has been in effect since then. And even before this was adopted, we knew with um, any set of regulations that are new and um, 600 plus pages, that there will be changes, things that we find um, didn't work quite the way we intended, or over time there'll be policy changes. Um, and so we've always said this is a living document and that it would be changed and revised periodically um, in through text amendments that go to city council for approval. And so we have been doing that and have had um, some text amendments that have already gone through and we'll have some others in the future as well as this one. So a little bit about the comprehensive plan and the guidance for this um, text amendment. We are focusing on the campus place type. The comprehensive plan includes um, 10 different place types. We're focusing on the zoning for one of those 10 place types, um, the campus place type. And this these are areas um, for large multi-building institutions, maybe religious, civic, uh, health facilities, hospitals, or a concentration of office and research and development uses. And what you'll find in these campus place types um, is that the primary use may vary depending on the purpose of the campus. Um, it may be more of an office-based campus, um, an educational campus like a university. We'll show some examples in a minute um, and so forth, as well as um, other uses intended to support the primary use. 
Um, and again, we'll give you some examples in a minute of that. And um, you can see on the place type, also known as policy map, that the 10 different um, place types are mapped throughout our community. And this teal color is um, the campus place type. And you can see on both the left and the right um, that we have places where it has been mapped. Um, uh, on the right is actually um, UNC Charlotte and University Research Park, but we have obviously other places throughout the community with campus place type mapping. And so our campus zoning districts are designed to implement the campus place type. Next slide. And currently we have four zoning districts to implement the campus place type because there are really um, lots of kind of different types of campus place type. We have the IC1, the institution, the, one of our two institutional campus zoning districts um, for large scale institutional campuses like the government center, educational, medical, um, social service and continuum of care. Again, may have supportive uses. And um, this is a more spread out open form of development than what you might find for the IC2 or Institutional Campus 2 Zoning District. Same types of uses, um, similar supportive uses, but a more compact form of development with uh, taller structures, more densely developed. Then we have the OFC or Office Flex Campus Zoning District, um, large-scale office research medical uses, some light assembly and supportive uses. And again, relatively low intensity reflects a lot of our existing um, suburban business parks. They're not all of them. Um, many of them are also centers as well. And then finally, we have the Research Campus Zoning District which is currently up in the research park as the primary location of it. Large scale uh, research campus with a mixed use environment. Again, those supportive uses and also the, the goal of taller structures, more pedestrian oriented urban environment. So as we have um, been working with the uh, campus districts. We have heard from uh, users and learned ourselves that there have been a couple of issues that we want to address through this text amendment. One, there's been some confusion among UDO users about the approach to the permitted uses and um, show you in a minute probably why there is that uh, confusion. The use matrix, which is where you go to learn what kind of uses can be are allowed in each zoning district, talks about campus uses such as an educational campus and identifies those as being appropriate in these districts, but doesn't go to the individual uses that you might find on an educational campus, like a school, um, like depending on the type of educational campus, a restaurant, some retail. And so that's been very confusing because we thought, well, we'll just describe an educational campus, say that there are supportive uses and the types of supportive uses, and we won't go through um, checking the box for each of those um, types of uses on the campus. But that ended up being very confusing for a lot of people because if they had, for example, IC1 zoning and um, they were maybe a, a university, they would go look to see that a university was allowed and it would not be showing up. So we'll show you that in a minute, um, why that's confusing. We also had an issue as we were working with our area planning team that there are concentrations of office uses that are not really part of maybe an institutional campus. And this is particularly what we found the medical office near um, some of the, the larger medical facilities. So these concentrations of medical office, for example, 
are mapped as a campus place type, they're not really on the campus of, say, the hospital facility, and that we needed a new office district that could be used um, in that situation. So we will go into more detail on both of those items, and I'm going to talk about the uses and what we've done for that, proposing for the campus zoning districts, and then Alan will be talking about the new um, the new district that we're proposing for general office. So again, the confusion over the approach to permitted uses for the campus districts for the three that did not have them identified. And um, what we're doing to address that is amending the use matrix to show which individual uses are permitted and also adding um, prescribed conditions that uh, state that certain uses have to be related to the primary uh, use uh, that is uh, on the campus. So for example, if you have a hospital campus, a um, bank may be found in the hospital, you know, ATM, maybe a bank, maybe a restaurant, whatever, that those types of uses have to be related to the hospital. It's not just that someone, that the hospital sells off a, a parcel and someone puts a, a restaurant at the edge of the campus. It really needs to be integral to the campus. So um, next, so anyway, going back and, and stepping back a little bit, we have um, going forward six types of campuses, the continuum care retirement community with an example being Aldersgate, um, Johnson C. Smith, an example of an educational campus, the government center being a government campus, L um, Atrium Health Maine being a medical, um, a religious campus, an example being Calvary Church down on Highway 51, and uh, Valerie Woodard Center is an example of a social service campus. And um, you can see that what we only had previously, we haven't um, dropped these campus uses, but we've added to it is that, you know, we had, for example, for um, a hospital facility, a medical campus, and it explained um, what a medical campus was, and that it could also include dormitories and other housing, dining rooms, cafeterias, gift shops, pharmacies, other supportive commercial uses like retail goods, um, and so forth. And that that is the way that we were trying to say what uses would be allowed um, on a medical campus. Again, that while that was good information, people weren't necessarily even making it to that part of the use table before they became confused. So as we move forward, um, and you can see this is how we had these listed before. We also did have an office campus, but in the changes we've made, find that that's no longer necessary. So um, this is uh, really all that we had before for the campus uses. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that we did not check um, in any way the individual uses um, on the left. That's what has been in the UDO. And on the right, what we've done um, is what we're proposing to do is um, show which uses are allowed by right without conditions with an X in these different campus districts and um, also which ones are allowed with prescribed conditions, which is frequently saying it needs to relate back to the primary institutional um, use. Not always, but that particularly for IC1 and IC2 is what you're gonna find. And I will point out that the research campus, the RC campus always used that approach. So we're not making a change to that approach there. We're just using the approach we had for the research campus for the other districts. Next slide. Um, so we um, also, again, as I've mentioned, have certain supportive uses with a prescribed condition that stipulates that the use must be rela a related component intended to serve and support the campus. 
Um, one example is a financial institution when located in institutional campus one or two has to be a related component intended to serve and support um, one of these campus types, educational, government, medical, or CCRC. Um, probably more striking is a gas station when located in the institutional campus uses has to be a related component intended to support and serve an educational government or medical campus. And the gas station is intended only for the fueling of fleet vehicles associated with the campus, doesn't have retail components. So that means that if there is a gas station on um, say uh, an educational campus, it's not a gas station that is selling gas to the public. None of us could drive up and fill up our vehicles there. It would only be for the fleet. Um, so I think what, before we jump in, Alan, um, uh, Rebecca asked the question, mm -hmm. what about charging stations? And that is something that right now we would consider that um, the same as a gas station, but in um, a future text amendment, whether it's the soonest cleanup or the one after that, we'll get that clarified. Um, I think we've talked about calling those like fueling stations or, or something like that um, instead of gas stations to show that there's more than one type of fuel for our um, for our, our vehicles these days. Yeah, however, if I can jump in, that doesn't mean that we would not allow some charging stations to be installed in a parking lot or a parking absolutely, garage. Absolutely. Um, in, on the campus. In fact, in some instances, we have a UDO requirement for some EV charging. So when you said charging stations, there are some ideas out there to build a standalone charging station, which would kind of function like a gas station. Um, so we haven't tackled that head on just yet. But it is uh, on the list. <laughs> yep. Um, we can pause here before I get into the uh, new office district discussion to, um, I, other than the question from Rebecca about charging stations, I don't see any other questions. Um, if you've got some, we'll be happy to answer them either now or we can wait until the end of the presentation. We've got a few more slides and uh, we can pause again to see if you've got any questions. So if I don't hear anything in the next couple of seconds, I will proceed. Okay. Uh, as Laura mentioned earlier, the another part of this campus text amendment is the creation of a new general office zoning district that we are abbreviating OG, much to some people's delight. Um, and Laura did talk about the reason, the concern that we're addressing with this uh, part of the text amendment, the concentration of often of, of office uses that are not. Um, specifically part of a campus, um, but they are mapped currently as a campus place type. And uh, we felt a need for a new general office district to use for these kinds of uh, locations, office locations. So this text amendment will create a new um, general office zoning district intended to accommodate these areas of general office development. They are, um, predominantly supplemental to or supportive of an institutional campus, uh, but they can also be a standalone office use that is completely unrelated to um, an institution such as a, a medical campus or an educational campus. Uh, this slide shows a, an example of um, the aerial photo is an example of uh, one such concentration of offices that is currently mapped as a campus but does not specifically function as a campus. They are independent offices that are clustered together. Um, they um, don't function as a campus. And we think that this area and others like it would be a good candidate for um, using the new general office zoning district. This is the proposed purpose statement that will go with the new OG zoning district. 
if it's adopted. I won't necessarily uh, read the whole thing, but I will pause here and give you a minute to read through it, um, and then we'll move on. If you've got any questions about this, uh, but this purpose statement goes, we, all of our zoning districts have a purpose statement that gives a flavor of what we're trying to accomplish with each zoning district. And so this is what we are, um, our vision, uh, if you will, for what will, uh, where we'll be using the OG district. This also um, is good guidance for our staff and our elected and appointed officials um, to, uh, it gives them some context for uh, zoning and rezonings. Okay, I'm going to move on. Some of the key development standards in this proposed new office district, um, these are some things that we think uh, people are uh, interested in. For one, uh, the uses that will uh, now show up in the use matrix for the OG zoning district, they're predominantly office with some limited retail and restaurant uses. Um, there will be no residential or industrial uses permitted um, in the OG district. Our setbacks are very similar to the IC1 and OFC uh, existing uh, uh, campus districts. The front setback, which is the distance from the future back of curb to the building um, is typically anywhere from 20 to 40 feet. It varies according to the street type that, um, that the parcel is located on different street types and different street widths will have a uh, different setback. The side setbacks to the from the building to the side yard line is 10 feet. That's the minimum in all cases. And uh, that set, the rear setback is 20 feet. The maximum building height in this district would be 40 feet with the option of building up to 80 feet tall with a sufficient number of development bonus points. We have a, a development bonus incentive for additional building height that we're currently using in several of our zoning districts. Um, I won't go too deeply into that other than to say that um, the base height, the base maximum height is 50 feet, but if you earn enough bonus points through our development bonus incentives, uh, your building can be up to 80 feet. Tony, I see your hand up. I will stop when I get through um, this slide and then we'll, uh, we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, build two zones, um, we will only have on a main street, which will be a very rare occasion probably for this uh, particular OG zoning district. A build two zone, if you're not familiar, establishes that you have to put the front uh, facade of your building um, in a certain zone from the back of the uh, sidewalk. So we use these in a lot of our more urban zoning districts to encourage buildings to move closer to the street to provide a, a more walkable urban environment. Uh, we won't have uh, build two zones in this district. Our maximum building length is 500 feet uh, with an option to increase that length to 700 feet with additional design elements. Those additional design elements are covered in a footnote um, in the table that addresses uh, building length. Uh, we use the, those design elements for uh, additional building length currently in a number of our other zoning districts. Transparency, which is the percentage of a wall that has to be clear windows and doors. Um, our proposed standards for OG are similar to all of the other campus districts. It's 40% on the ground floor and 15% on the upper floor. Um, that is so that we don't end up with a, a lot of blank wall uh, next to sidewalks as you go by a building, which um, doesn't uh, provide for uh, any um, interest or, or um, uh, just architecturally, it, it just uh, is not a good design feature. So we, we do want clear windows and doors. And then finally, uh, parking. Um, the OG district will be in the tier one uh, parking tier. If you're a little familiar with the uh, UDO parking requirements, 
all uses are rather, I should say, all zoning uh, districts are um, placed into one of three tiers. Tier one uh, has a minimum parking requirement for uses, but does not have a maximum parking requirement. The typical minimum requirement for the OG district would be one parking space per 750 square feet of gross floor area, although some uses may have a slightly different uh, parking requirement depending on the use. Um, Tony, before I move to the next slide, did you have a question on this slide? Yeah, just a couple really quick. First, to the most recent comment, just quick reminder, what are tier two and tier three parking requirements? Tier two is um, has both parking minimum and maximum parking requirements. Um, and tier three has no minimum parking requirements, but does have a maximum. So we think of them in terms of intensity or um, a, so that our tier one uses are, if you will, are more suburban auto oriented um, zoning districts. Um, tier two are um, areas that um, still are probably somewhat auto oriented, but we want to encourage more mobility. And so we have both a minimum and a maximum parking standard. And then um, tier three are our most urban um, areas. And uh, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, we will not have any minimum parking requirement, but rather parking maximums. Right, okay, thanks. Yeah, I remember doing a zoning years ago where it was very close to the light rail line and it was like for a restaurant, I think, and there was, almost no parking and people were saying, well, I don't want to approve this because there's no parking. Mm -hmm. and, but that was the point that, you know, people would be using the light rail and the business owners got that. But that anyway, my other question was um, just from a big picture standpoint. Um, I mean, this seems very reasonable, um, but I just have a, a sort of a, a question to get my head around it. And that is um, uh, sort of a two part question. Number one, why would this office campus, you know, general office type campus thing, not just be part of the uh, existing campus type that it was attached to, you know, whether it was institutional or one of the others? And why does it have to be uh, created? Um, and so that leads to my second question, where is is this to somehow conform uh, the policy to conform the policy map or something like that, or is it because you're seeing uh, people coming in and wanting to do office on the campuses in, in the existing campus places and zonings, but it's somehow just not working quite right? I mean, so what's the what are we getting at here? These are for office uses that are not, they may be mapped as a campus place type on the policy map, but they are not part of a campus like a hospital, for example, which would be a medical, let's just use Atrium's main campus because it's probably our largest medical campus. Um, you may have a cluster of offices nearby that maybe have a number of medical offices in them and they support um, the hospital, but they're not part of the campus, and yet their their map is a campus place type. They don't function um, as a campus. They may even be a standalone um, office building. It's mapped as a campus, but it is not a campus. Um, okay, Alan, and, if, oh, please jump ahead. in, Laura. I was just going to say, maybe as an example, um, near the MIP Museum on Randolph, there is a lot of medical office in that area, um, but it is not in any way touching the Atrium campus or the Novant campus, but it really becomes an office campus of its own. Got it. Um, so, it, and so I guess it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. So this is to sort of 
conform the the ordinance to what really exists on the ground? Or do, do you have people also coming in and saying, I want to do something like that in it? You know, it might be a mile away from the campus, like from Atrium or from UNC Charlotte or Johnson C. Smith or whatever. I mean, what's really going on? It's really reflecting the current needs that we've seen. Um, we're not seeing um, and don't anticipate that there being a lot of this um, this far from the campus in the future. There, there may be some clusters. Some of these areas also in the future may um, morph into centers, um, but they do exist now. And we thought it was important. They're an important part of our economy. They're an important part of um, really our healthcare system. And we did want to reflect them and show that they are out there and that they're important to our community. So what are they now? Like, for example, the, the, the cluster on Randolph. Um, I think it probably, if it was zoned, we used to have in the old ordinance, if it's not conditional, if it's conditional, it's still the old ordinance, it probably, um, it was 01 or 02 and uh, went to Office Flex campus, but that's really more for a business park that might have some light assembly, a little bit of warehouse, didn't reflect the context that these were in. So that's probably how it translated. And we thought we needed something that better fit um, what these areas are now or what they might start to adjust into. Got it. Good answer. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, um, Tony. I think we're pretty much at the end uh, of the discussion of the new OG district. So let me finish up by just recapping um, what is proposed in this text amendment, uh, mainly two parts. The first uh, is what Laura discussed. It will amend the use matrix to show individual uses that are permitted in each campus district. So it will look you know, like most of the other, all of the other zoning districts that have individual uses with either a, a permitted or permitted with prescribed conditions. And we will add prescribed conditions to certain uses that stipulate that those uses have to be related components that are intended to serve and support the campus. And then the second part of this text amendment is the creation of the new general office or OG zoning district that we just spoke about. Um, the timeline for this particular text amendment, it was filed in December. We brought it to our UDO advisory uh, committee for discussion and feedback in January. We um, have made a couple of changes based on the feedback that we have received since then. So where we are now is the uh, February meeting in Black community review and comments. That's what we're doing today. Uh, if we uh, um, hear um, comments that will compel us to make changes uh, be to this text amendment, and I don't know that we've heard any yet, we will. If not, we will uh, file the uh, revised text amendment um, very soon. And then uh, going forward, we will have a public hearing at, the, uh, at a March city council meeting, followed by a zoning committee recommendation all, uh, in April. And finally, the last step in the process is a, a decision by city council also in April. So this is our current timeline. I think we're probably on uh, track. I don't see any changes to this going forward. Uh, final slide. Uh, will it kind of direct you to our udo.org, charlotteudo.org website for additional information. If you want to read the full text amendment, which we are showing as a red line so you can see what is changing, um, Right at the top of the website, there's a drop down list for UDO amendments. So uh, you can go there and read the text amendment. Uh, also, uh, we will have uh, these slides available in the next couple of days on our website. 
and we have recorded both this meeting and our noontime meeting, and you'll be able to, within the next uh, two or three days, uh, look at a um, recording of the meeting. So if you want to go back and hear what we said again, um, or go back and look through these slides at your own pace, um, you'll be able to do that in a couple of days um, at our website. So that is all we have. Um, we can feel free to uh, raise your hand or un unmute if you have questions. <clears throat> this is this is Kevin um, Allen, um, and I, I would invite um, either yourself or Laura to chime in here as necessary. But I wanted to um, kind of on some of the feedback that we had heard from our earlier session today, bring forward for the benefit of this evening's participants, just a slight bit of nuance that I, I think maybe um, just adds a little bit extra seasoning to some of these considerations and discussions, and which is, um, should this proposed text amendment uh, be approved and adopted by uh, council uh, to be clear for everybody that, that that is not going to put that new OG zoning district on the ground right away. Um, that would really only come into play should, um, you know, a project come in and a private property owner want to proactively um, take advantage of that new zoning district and zone to that new OG zoning district. Or as um, some of you may be familiar with, with alignment rezoning in the community area planning process, getting ready to kick off um, some of those areas and, and looking at those for examination where adjustments may need to be made, OG may then at that point also find its way onto the ground in the community. But this text amendment in and of itself was, is not going to necessarily put an OG zoning on any parcel on the ground. Thank you. Thank Kevin. you. Yeah. Helpful. All right. Well, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and night.